Um, our guest presenter is Jennifer Gate from Victoria today. Jennifer is a life coach specializing in chronic pain relief, helping people who live with chronic pain live fuller and more joy joyful lives. She's a former nurse, health researcher, and health policy analyst who spent many years with chronic pain. When uh, Jennifer discovered neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to change itself, she found out how to relieve her own chronic pain and now shares her knowledge with others so they can live unencumbered by persistent pain. I'm going to pass the webinar over to her and welcome Jennifer. Well, thank you, Desiree. Hello, Kate and Rebecca so far, and welcome to this webinar on retraining your brain to relieve your pain. I love telling people about this because as someone who had chronic pain for many years, I know how difficult it can be. So my intention in this presentation is to give you hope of healing your pain. And I'm going to start by telling you a short version of my years with chronic pain and how I healed it. Although I spent my career in healthcare, I'm not a physician nor a brain scientist, and so my story and the help I've given others are simply my credentials for, for presenting this information. Then we'll look at what pain is and what the brain has to do with it. I'm going to explain how different brain areas are involved, the role that emotions play in chronic pain, and what neuroplasticity is and how it can cause chronic pain. I'm going to be giving you a lot of information fairly fast, but I have simplified it hopefully to make it easy to understand. And the latter part of my presentation will be on what you can do to relieve your pain. I'm going to leave about 15 minutes for questions at the end, so please save your questions till then as um, if you start to type them in too early, they may get missed. And before I start, there's two things I especially want to stress. The first is that although I'm talking about pain being in the brain, I know that is real pain felt in the body, and I know how distressing it can be. So please don't feel that I'm minimizing your suffering. And the second thing is that pain's a warning signal that something may be wrong with the body. So if you develop a new pain, or um, have a pain that has not yet been evaluated by a physician, you should tell your physician about it. So let's get started with my story. I've had two disc injuries in my life. The first in 1977 when I slipped a disc and had acute pain for a year, and then had surgery which reduced the pain considerably, but it took about six months to disappear, and then kept returning several times over the next 23 years. But I was deeply involved in the medical model, and I felt it was just something I had to live with. Then at the end of 2000, I was undergoing a lot of stress, and one of my discs split into four pieces. I had surgery within uh, two weeks, and the pain lessened during my four days in hospital. But when I returned home to the same stresses, I was very stewed in chronic in acute pain again. It was so bad that even with a lot of medication, I could only stand for a minute walk for a minute and a half, and sit for 10 minutes. So I was constantly cycling through sitting, standing, walking, and it was exhausting. I started water therapy, which helped, and taught myself to walk a bend by driving to a local chip trail and walking for 45 seconds, resting on my sports stick for half a minute, and then walking another 45 seconds. Gradually, thank goodness, I learned to walk for longer. And as I got stronger from walking water therapy, I could also stand and sit for longer, and so life got easier, but I was still quite disabled. So let's fast forward to 2008, when I read a book called The Brain That Changes Itself by Dr. Norman Deutsch. He was a Canadian psychiatrist who traveled across Canada and the US, interviewing neuroscientists who were using the new science of neuroplasticity to cure people with neuro neurological conditions. So I began to put some of the ideas I learned from the book into practice and found that my pain lessened. It took about a year for me to be free of both pain and medication. And now I very rarely have any pain anywhere in my body. And when I do get pain, I respond to it in a completely different way. So let's take a look at the first slide, which if we can get it to work. Um, which defines pain. So pain's an unpleasant sensory whoa, and emotional experience, which is associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in t terms of such damage. 
And chronic pain is constant or intermittent pain that lasts longer than three to six months, depending really on which area you're in. So this, the definition of pain, nothing says that the pain has to be created by the body. But it does talk about experience. So what is experience? Experience is everything that happens inside you caused by activation of brain cells. So if you're thinking of moving a muscle or having an emotion or dreaming or imagining or any of the other things or feeling pain or pleasure, all these are caused by brain cells firing and sending information and energy to other brain cells. So in effect, pain is an activation in brain cells. So you can't really talk much about the brain without talking about the mind. And no one really actually knows where the mind is, but it's not in the brain. So the mind regulates the flow of energy and information in the brain. And um, the brain and the mind interact with each other so profoundly that they're best understood as a single codependent mind-brain system. And because they're so interlinked, if you change your brain, you'll change your mind. And if you change your mind, you'll change your brain. So this could have been called retraining your brain to retrain your mind to relieve your pain, but it, that was rather a long title. So the body has a pain system, and um, it's run by nociceptors, which are sort of sensory danger receptors that run through the body tissues to the spinal cord and then up the spinal cord. And the spinal cord nociceptors relay sensations to the thalamus, which decides if they're dangerous based on your beliefs, emotions, your, and your personal history. So if they're dangerous, um, then the thalamus sees them as pain, these sensations. And if they're not dangerous, dangerous, they see them as not pain. Then the message of pain or no pain is sent down the descending pathways into the body. So the pain is not felt in the body until the brain determines it is somehow dangerous. So we'll come back to pain again um, after we've looked at how the brain may create the pain. So this is a cross section of the brain cut from front to back. And the brain has two hemispheres. So it's almost as though you were sitting in the middle between the two hemispheres and looking at the right hand hemisphere. And so chronic pain results as an overreactive fight or flight response, which is a physiological response to danger that starts in the oldest part of our brain, known as the brain stem. And this is the area that we share with all other uh, animals with vertebra backbones. So that's the area shown in red at the bottom of the screen. The fight and flight response is also known as the stress response, and it causes bodily changes that help us to react to danger by fighting it or by running away from it. And this stress response is called by something called the sympathetic nervous system, a part of the autonomic nervous system that runs from the brain down the spinal cord and sends nerves out to the body. So once the danger is over, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is another nervous system within the autonomic nervous system, and this is called the calming system. So the parasympathetic nervous system calms the sympathetic nervous system down, and the body comes back into a state of balance called homeostasis. Now, the fight and flight response was created, <laughs> you can call that, to respond to physical danger. And it's still useful for that. I mean, if you step out in front of a taxi and catch it out of the corner of your eye, you'll be back on the pavement before you even knew almost that you, you, were in, you were in danger. But when the emotional brain evolved, and that's the part of the brain uh, outlined in purple just above the red area, the stress response could also be brought on by the emotions. And the, the emotions brought on the stress response as a reaction to non-physical danger. Because as social beings, we worry about fitting in and what other people think of us. Do they like us? Are we meeting expectations? And if not, this can be seen as dangerous. 
So the emotional brain has got several structures which are involved in memory as well as emotion and which include the thalamus and that was that structure that looked at the incoming stimuli to decide whether it was dangerous or not. Like the brain stem, the limbic system is unconscious. So in general we can't control it, but it has some connection to the conscious brain so it can learn. So then the outer court level of layer of the brain, the cortex evolved. And when that happened, thoughts and beliefs which occur in the cortex could stimulate emotions in the limbic system, which then might stimulate the stress response. You'll notice that the cortex, which is that sort of whitish area at the top, is curled around so the front of it almost hits the, limb, the purple of the limbic system. So the limbic system and the cortex can communicate with one another. So as a result of all this um, thoughts, emotions, being able to stimulate the stress response, many people have a chronically high stress response, a chronically high sympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic nervous system can't calm the body down. Chronic stress can also lead to physical symptoms such as gastrointestinal disturbances, muscle aches, headaches, fatigue, and um, long-term stress then sensitizes the body so it has an overreaction to any new stress. So in a nutshell, but where have we got to now, the stress response can be brought on by actual danger, which then stimulates emotions in a bottom-up response from the brain stem or it can be brought on by thoughts and beliefs in the cortex that trigger emotions top-down towards the limbic system which may then stimulate the brain stem. So the stress response is also increased by habits such as people pleasing and perfectionism. It's very stressful to try and please other people all the time and it's impossible to do everything perfectly. So the, then we look at the, um, the cortex now. So the area uh, outlined in green on your screen is called the cingulate cortex, and it's a linking area between the cortex and the limbic system. And the area of solid green is called the anterior cingulate cortex, or the ACC for short. And it's in this area that both physical pain and emotional pain show up on a functional MRI. Now, a functional MRI is an MRI they take when somebody is experiencing something. And in this case, these two cases, they would have been experiencing pain. But they, they, neuroscientists could look to see uh, when someone's experiencing anger, where that shows up in the brain. But anyway, both emotional pain and physical pain show up in the brain in that ACC, that green area. And so the brain um, probably doesn't discriminate between them. And then the area uh, in the cortex, the white area just in front of and above the ACC is called the anterior frontal cortex. And this becomes important um, when we want to try and control the pain through thoughts and through thoughts, basically. So let's sum up what we've got so far. The stress response is no longer limited to physical danger, so it's overactive and increased by habits. The parasympathetic nervous system is no longer able to calm the sympathetic nervous system response. And ongoing stress causes physiological changes and uncomfortable emotions which may themselves set up the stress response and cause pain as a way of alerting the organism as a whole to danger. So we've talked quite a bit about emotions, so let's have a look at what emotions are. Dr. Candice Pert was a chief brain scientist in the US National Health for 12 years. And before that and after, she devoted many years to researching emotions. So she says that emotions are physical feelings caused by neuropeptides, which are um, very, very small uh, chemical, locking into receptors in body cells. So each neuropeptide has a particular shape, and each receptor, the, re the receptor for that 
uh, neuropeptide has that particular shape. So you can have a, a, a cell which has many receptors for many different neuropeptides, and they all need to know where to go because it fits their shape. So emotions are also a vehicle that mind and body use to communicate with one another. And emotions are not caused by a situation itself, but by the meaning we give to the situation. And I'm sure that all you've had an experience whereby maybe you were with a, you were with a friend and something happened and you both had a completely different reaction to it. And that different reaction was caused by the meaning that you gave to that particular situation. You both gave different meanings. Emotions are also telling us that our response to something is or is not serving us. And it's usually our response to the meaning. And the meaning, of course, is something that we provided ourselves. Now, Dr. Pert says emotions need to be felt and expressed in order to be released. So pushing them away or pushing them down or ignoring them keeps them in place. We'll have a look at quick look at resistance. Many people resist pain when they're in it. And resistance, or its opposite, clinging to what is happening in the moment, increases stress and causes suffering. And not to Nisagada at a, I can't sure how you pronounce that actually, suffering is due entirely to clinging or resisting. It's a sign of unwillingness to move on to flow with life. And life is always flowing forward. We can't actually stop it or push it back. We have to go with it. And it's when you try to stop it or to stop things happening that you suffer because of resistance. The good thing is that because life is always flowing forward, even if you don't like what's happening in the moment, the next moment might bring you something different. So pain, I believe, is emotionally, not physically based. And this is why. We know that the thalamus considers information from many areas in the brain when determining whether a sensation is dangerous or not. Emotional pain, pain and physical pain show up on brain scans in the same area of the brain. And likely the brain does not discriminate between them. Pain to it is pain. It's danger whether it's physical or emotional. The MRIs of soft tissue in the abdomen show spinal problems in people without any pain. So it used to be that when they, they couldn't take um, images of the soft tissue in, in your body because uh, x-rays didn't show it up. But when MRIs came along, they would take MRIs of people's abdomens to look at various organs in there. Uh, but at the same time, they could see the spine behind the organ that they were trying to, to focus on. And they found that all sorts of people who had no pain whatsoever had s terrible spines, spines that any self-respecting neurological surgeon or um, uh, orthopedic surgeon would probably tell you needed an operation right away. Also, chronic pain and chronic disease are more common in those who've had childhood trauma. And this is likely because um, memories in traumatic memories are not uh, stored in the same way as uh, non-traumatic memories. And so they're very difficult to access. But they're still there in the background running and ha um, having an effect on people. So let's look at pain definition number two. Now, Dr. Rama Chandran is a neuroscientist and, uh, who studied pain and who invented a way of relieving phantom limb pain. And when he says, pain in his opinion on the organism's state of health rather than a mere reflexive response to injury, he's not just talking about physical health, but emotional and spiritual health as, as well. So the health of the whole organism. So now let's have a look at neuroplasticity and see what it is. So the brain's natural function to form new connections by altering the pattern of brain cell activation in response to experience. 
Neuroscientific research indicates that experience can actually change both the brain's physical structure and functional organization. So that again, that word experience crops up. And we know that experience is brain cells firing for anything that you, uh, occurs in your body, including your brain. So this is a picture of a brain cell. Now each brain cell is composed of a cell body, which is called the soma, and has a nucleus in it, and many dendrites that sprout out from the cell body. And the dendrites receive incoming information in the form of energy from other neurons. Now there's only one axon, and that carries information out of the cell when it's activated. So a wave of activation, which is like an electrical current flows down the axon to the terminal tips. And these terminal tips connect with dendrites from other neurons. And they send either an electrical current or a neurotransmitter, a chemical, across a very small space known as the synapse between the tip of an axon terminal and the tip of a dendrite. And then the dendrites carry the received impulses into the cell body of their neurons and cause them to fire or to deactivate. So there's only one axon in each neuron, but the neuron can increase the number of neurons it connects by increasing the number of dendrites. And so you get something looking a little bit like this. On average, each of our 100 billion neurons in the brain shares about 10,000 synapses with other neurons. So under certain conditions, Neural firing causes the synaptic connection between neurons to strengthen. So one such condition is repetition. If a neuron receiving incoming signals from the dendrites of another neuron then fires at the same time as the previous neuron, by, by, and so it fires, the first neuron fires, the second neuron gets a signal, and then fires, and then sends um, signals out through its axon to another neuron. This tends to build lasting synaptic connections with this group of neurons. So this is summed up in the saying, neurons that fire together wire together. But if this particular experience that was happening was stopped or was performed less frequently, then the connections between the two neurons would be broken, and they would fire apart, and so wire apart. So other conditions that strengthen the connections are novelty, so doing something new, like a pianist, for example, learning a, a new piece. Um, the, the neurons responsible for his finger movements in the brain um, would strengthen their connections. But once he'd really learned the piece and probably stopped paying it so often, then, uh, and moved on to something else, then the connections would probably weaken. Emotions associated with experience and with the careful focus of attention also build connections. So focusing your attention on experience is probably one of the easiest ways that you can start building connections. So talk about creating a pain path. So when we frequently resist pain by focused attention on it and the uncomfortable emotions that accompany it, we activate the stress response and build a pain path in your brain, just as walking across a lawn over and over will create a path across it. But just as walking around the lawn rather than over it will allow the grass to grow and the path to disappear, so relating to your pain differently will cause new neural connections to form. Then the pain may either go away or it may lessen or it may still remain, but you wouldn't suffer from it. So let's look at some of the things that you can do that will bring that about. So the goal in retraining the brain is not to make the pain go away, but to stop resisting the pain. Because wanting the pain to go away activates the amygdala in the um, limbic system, the emotional system, and sets off the fight and flight response, which leads to ongoing pain and suffering. So a goal, so you should set a goal not to be free of pain, 
but for something that you want to do that the pain is holding you back from doing, and that when you are free of pain, you will be able to do or do more of. And then you say, well, what will be the first small step that you can take to that goal? Because the trick to achieving things is to take very small steps so you don't get frightened by them. The next thing to do is to identify your pain triggers. Now, pain triggers are things that happen that you react to that cause you pain. And the easiest way to identify the pain triggers is to go back to what was happening when you, when you first developed pain, of course, it, unless it was years and years ago and you can't remember. But look at the situations, emotions, thoughts, and feelings that you were having at that time. And look at what you might have been resisting at that time. And now, then look for similar triggers when pain occurs. So similar triggers might be similar emotions, similar thoughts, or similar situations, or even similar people that, that um, trigger the pain. Once you've identified what the pain trigger is, try and change the meaning that you give to it. So for example, um, with me, <laughs> I believe that my mother-in-law didn't approve of me. And, um, that, to a certain extent, caused me pain. Um, but I could have changed that meaning to the fact that um, she just thought I did things differently than she did, or something. But changing the meaning you give to a trigger actually um, often prevents the trigger from triggering you any longer. Also look for the pain you're resisting in other areas of your life. So if, for example, you have other, uh, when you have NF, so you might be resisting that, or you, you may have other uh, illnesses that are caused by stress, so you could be resisting those, or you might be resisting other people or situations. So looking at what you're resisting and other things causing you emotional pain will help you decide uh, what meanings you have to change. Okay, next thing is to calm the autonomic nervous system and the limbic system because they're overstimulated and overstressed. One of the things to do is to, to start doing something you love every day. Most people find that when they use distraction, um, the pain tends to get better or to go away for a while whilst they're doing whatever they're doing to distract themselves. But it actually doesn't train your brain because it's not something that you're really, really focusing on doing and focusing on whilst you're doing. And people may be using television or dinners out with people. But if you do something that you really love daily and really pay attention to what you're doing and pay attention to the, the reason that you're doing it is to bring yourself pleasure, then you can actually start to set up um, good pathways in your brain. Feeling and naming your emotions is important. Um, Dr. Pert said that feeling them is important in order for just for them to leave. But naming them is important too because when you name them, you activate the uh, frontal lobes of your brain and you have the uh, limbic response to uncomfortable emotion. So when you have an emotion, feel it and name it. And also, um, I just read recently, if you see a facial, somebody's facial expression and they seem to be angry and you think they're angry at you, name the facial expression. You don't have to do it out loud, but you can name it inside because that also halves the limbic response for the same reason. Now, Breathing in our chests and breathing through our mouth are assigned to the um, sympathetic nervous system that we are in danger. Because when you are in danger and you're running or fighting, that's how you're breathing. You're breathing through your nose and through your, through your um, chest. But when you're calm, um, you should be breathing into your belly, which is the parasympathetic nervous system response. And it's very calming for the body. So if you can practice belly breathing three to five times daily, it reduces the sympathetic nervous system activity. 
and also always breathe through your nose when possible. Now if you're in pain and you want to reduce it, try touching your lips, stroking your lips, and people can do this quite naturally. And it increases the parasympathetic nervous response. And we're going to talk about mindful meditation in a minute or two. Next thing to do is to cultivate gratitude. Gratitude takes you out of the stress response and into the higher emotions. So you can cultivate it by keeping a gratitude diary. Every day write down at least three things you're grateful for. Because it's very difficult to feel grateful and stressed at the same time. And cultivating gratitude will then become a habit. It was funny, I did this when I started having pain. And uh, after about six months of doing it, I suddenly thought when I was writing, this is funny, I'm not noticing these things when, I, when they're happening, I'm just noticing them when I'm writing them down. <laughs> so then I practiced actually trying to feel gratitude in the moment. But writing the journal actually leads you to that, I think. Another kind of journal to keep every day is a journal about your thoughts and feelings about what's happening in your life. So journaling has been found in studies to reduce stress. And writing down your thoughts and feelings allows you to look at them from the outside and to see them in a different way. And it can also help to chart your progress in becoming calmer and less stressed. So a good model to follow is that described by Julia Cameron and the artist Way, and she calls it morning pages. Basically, you sit and write whatever comes up for at least 10 minutes. And if you're writing things about people you're living with, just keep the uh, journal hidden away somewhere. So the final important step, I think, is mindfulness. Mindfulness um, is basically comes from the Buddhist tradition, and the Buddhists are not it's not a religious tradition. The Buddha um, really didn't care whether anybody believed in God or not, and I'm not even sure that he did. But he was interested in finding out how the mind worked. And so he developed uh, meditation and this method of mindfulness, which is basically paying attention in the moment to what is happening, both outside you, but in this situation, we want you to look inside you, your thoughts, emotions, your body sensations, and without judging them or judging yourself or judging anyone else. And that's very difficult for us to do because most of us tend to judge ourselves a lot and not have a lot of compassion necessarily for ourselves. But again, a lack of compassion for yourself, guess what it does? It sets off the fight and flight system. So Mindfulness can help you become more compassionate, but it can also help you be more okay with whatever is happening in the moment. So what you do is you notice what's happening inside, and as you do that, over time you'll probably notice, but hopefully it won't judge, the negative judgments that you have of yourself and the stories you tell yourself about yourself and how these limit you in being less than you really are. And once you've started to notice things, then you can decide whether you're going to continue doing that or not. And the other thing of mindfulness is to cultivate self-compassion by treating yourself as you would a much-loved child, or if you don't have a child, as maybe as you treat your pet. So basically, if our child or our pet is upset, what we do is we sit with it and just be there with it, comforting it, but just, just our very presence, we realize, is comforting. And we tend not to do that with ourselves. We tend to get down on ourselves and almost push ourselves away, if that's possible, rather than just sitting with our pain and just being comforting. So what I want to do um, in the last five minutes before we're going to start the question period is I want to give you uh, an opportunity to practice for mindfulness. Uh, just a short experience of what it's like. I forgot to say that um, mind, being mindful allows your anterior frontal lobe, lobes to calm your limbic system. And so it's the most useful thing you can do to ch change your mind and become less reactive. And so change your brain to be less reactive. So now if you 
sit comfortably, preferably with your back straight and your feet flat on the floor. But if you're more comfortable lying down, then do that. So I'll just give you a few seconds to get into position. And then just listen to my voice and follow along with my suggestions. It may help to close your eyes so you're not distracted by things around you. Now bring your awareness to the present moment, focusing just on being here now. And now bring your awareness to your breath. Don't try to change it, but notice it coming in and out of your body. See where you most notice your breath as it comes and goes and focus on that place. It could be in your belly or your chest or in your nose or at the entrance to your nostrils. So just focus on your breath as it comes and goes in the place you have chosen to notice it. Now notice if you have any thoughts or emotions present. Don't judge them or get entangled with them. Just notice what is present. Now bring an attitude of curiosity to any thoughts or emotions you notice. Try and notice them as though you are an impartial observer. And use your breath as an anchor to return for a moment or two whenever you get entangled with a thought or emotion or whenever you start to judge it. Now notice any sensations in your body, again, without judging them or judging yourself. Just notice what is present with an attitude of acceptance. Just again be an impartial observer. If you have pain and find yourself reacting to it, return to a focus on your breath for a few moments, then sensations you may have.
Now return to just focusing on your breath. Now come back into the room, and when you're ready, open your eyes. So that concludes the presentation. I do have a list of books and other resources that you may find useful, and my website is under reconstruction at the moment. So I'll ask Desiree if she'll put the list on the BCNF site. And also, if anyone would like a 30-minute complimentary coaching session to help them put these strategies into practice, please contact me at wholepersoncoach at gmail.com. So who has any comments on your mindfulness experience or any questions about anything I have talked about? I've unmuted everybody, so you can go ahead and just ask your question instead of typing it. If you wanted to ask something of Jennifer. Jennifer, I have to say, it's Desiree, that um, I really enjoyed that experience because I didn't realize, well, you were talking, but uh, when I did the mindfulness exercise with you, that there's baby Robin right outside my door chirping away. So thank you for that. <laughs> I would not have noticed that otherwise. I would have gone on in my busy days. So it was the nicest experience. Good. Well, I guess that... Go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to say I found the presentation fascinating. Thank you. And it was very um, reassuring and, and, and absolutely uh, yeah, something that you feel that you can access. At least I do. Good, yeah. It can be a spiritual path. Yes. I'm having, um, Desiree, I'm having a little difficulty again because I'm getting feedback when people talk. It may be, it may be something to do with my headset, I guess. Well, if anybody has anything, they could also just use at the bottom of that control panel there, they can use the chat where they can, um, where you can type in what you'd like. Jennifer, this is Bruce, and I also enjoyed your uh, presentation. Thank you. What I found was that my mind was wandering when we did the mindfulness meditation, so to speak. Well, you know, minds do that, <laughs> and that's normal. And um, people often think when they're doing any kind of meditation that it's not a good med meditation if their mind wanders. But in fact, just bringing your mind back again and again to the focus of whatever it is you're focusing on is um, very helpful to your brain in itself. Okay, that's reassuring to hear. Well, all right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, thank you, Jennifer. That was great for those um, that want to go through that mindfulness exercise again, because, again, I think the more that you do it, the more you learn kind of mastery over your brain. It's something like any muscle. The more you work it, the stronger it gets. But um, mm -hmm. thank you for that. We'll post it up on the website so if you want to try it again. And um, Jennifer, then if, if you even have that, 
um, that list of books, we'll post that up as well. So thank you also to our participants for being here today. I know 5 o'clock is kind of an unusual time, but thank you for making space in your day. And I hope that you're able to take some of those things that Jennifer shared with us and uh, help relieve the pain in your life. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That was very fascinating and insightful. Thank you very much. I enjoyed doing it.